it's in a set like this, so you can have a set and uh, on your way to work or however you would like, you can go back over everything we've talked about in this marriage series. They are free. They're worth more than that, by the way, <laughs> but they're, they're free. Let me put this over here. It's also the case that uh, for all of our sermons, all of our services, you can always go online and, and not just hear but watch um, any one of our messages uh, online, so feel free to do that, all right? So a few things I want you to know. All right. Well, an elderly man, he, he lay in a hospital bed with his wife of 55 years at his bedside. Is that you, Ethel? At my side again, he whispered. Yes, dear, she answered. He softly said to her, remember years ago when I was in the veterans hospital? You were there with me then, Ethel. And even years before that, when we lost everything in that fire, there you were, by my side. And Ethel, when we were poor, you, you stuck with me then too. The man sighed, and then he said, I tell you, Ethel, you're bad luck. <laughs> Since I'm an equal opportunity offender, <laughs> you hear about the woman who testified in church one Sunday? Before I became a Christian, I hated my husband so much, I wouldn't have gone to his funeral had he died. Now that I know Jesus, I would go to his funeral anytime. <laughs> All right. There you have it. Well, we laugh at these stories, these little jokes, because, well, they're couched in humor, right? They make us laugh. But truth be known, and we do know the truth, we've been told it, we've experienced it. Pain is common in marriage, and it often runs very deep. Each one of us who is married is a victim. And each one of us who is married is a scoundrel. We've been injured, and we injure. The problem is we often get into a cycle of just that, pain and injury, of hurting and being hurt, until despair sets in, and one or both simply feel there's no way out, that somehow I'm destined to suffer, or maybe just live in mediocrity with my spouse. Sort of like a low-grade fever, right? Some marriages, they get by and function for the most part, but they function with no joy and with little energy for hope or change. Whether your marriage is experiencing today a period of growth or if it feels more like a grind, hear this, change is possible. Change is possible even if only one of the two of you is committed to it. We always talk about it takes two. I get it. I get it. But if we understand the biblical principles for how to approach a spouse in marriage, we come to understand that so very much on a deep, meaningful level can effectuate change, even if we're the only one investing. So, we spent two weeks initially establishing the definition, the purpose, and the nature of marriage. Then we spent a couple of weeks, right, on the behaviors in marriage which build the oneness God desires us to have, as well as taking a look at the behaviors which can sabotage, either intentionally or unintentionally, the oneness that God would desire us to have. So, this morning, as we wrap things up, we'll consider God's goal for your marriage, God's goals, plural, for your marriage. We won't unpack all the details of this passage, but I'd like you to see one of the many passages which speak to this subject, what we ought to be shooting for in marriage. Obviously, this is uh, the Apostle Paul. I'm going to read from Ephesians. And do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Remember, he's going to give a fact here, a reality. He has identified you as his own guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of redemption. Therefore, look at the next verse, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. How? The next two words are the most important in the entire passage. Just as. Not just as your spouse loves you, or someone else loves you, but just as God through Christ has loved you enough to forgive you. 
That's how we're supposed to interact. So, you could call that passage your goal in marriage, to love just as Jesus loves. Let's take a look at goals before we go through. We're going to go through six of them in just a minute. But I'd like to say something about the nature of goals. It's extremely important to be able to differentiate in a relationship context. I'm speaking about a relationship context. Obviously, particularly here, it's marriage. In the context of marriage, it's very important that we understand the difference between a goal in marriage and a desire in marriage. To help us understand the difference, Dr. Larry Crabb writes as follows. A goal having to do with marriage, may be defined as a purpose to which a person is unalterably committed. You're all in. He or she assumes unconditional responsibility for a goal, and it can be achieved. Listen closely. It can be achieved if he or she is willing to work at it. So you'll notice something here. It's talking about one individual. In the context of relationships, A goal is something that you can do whether anybody else gets involved or not. A desire, on the other hand, may be identified or defined as something wanted that cannot be obtained without the cooperation of another person, in this case, your spouse. It's an objective for which a person can assume no ultimate responsibility because it is beyond his control. In other words, it takes two. A goal takes one in a relationship. A desire has to do with two. It takes two for it to be achieved. So, you could say it this way. Goals are objectives towards which we should work. Desires are objectives for which we should pray. Let me play this out a little bit. My spouse will always agree with me. Is that a good goal? No. Well, okay. I already gave you my jokes for the day. I'm not trying to be funny. No. But of course that's not a good goal. And it's not a good goal because you can't control that. What it is is a wonderful desire. I would like my spouse to agree with me. If she agrees with me all the time, we're going to be wrong sometimes because I'm not always right. Right? But that's a desire, not a goal. What would be a good goal in that, in that context? Well, that I would share my feelings and opinions with my spouse with humility and care. Now, there's the goal because I can completely control it. A bad goal, my spouse will respect me. Because you can't demand respect. And what if they choose not to? Okay, then it's not a goal, it's a desire. A good goal would be pay very close attention to her needs, be a man of honor, be a man of integrity and selflessness. Probably at the end of the day, then she'll respect you. But the goal is having to do with your behavior which you can fully control. A bad goal, my spouse will understand me. A good goal, well, I'll ask questions. I will make it a goal to be attentive to her. I'll be a good listener when my spouse wants to talk. A bad goal, my spouse will admit that he or she is wrong when they are, right? Well, that's not a good goal. I hope they would do that, but I can't force them, so it's not a goal. What would my goal be? I will forgive my spouse. I will forgive my spouse whether or not they ask me to forgive them when they're wrong. A bad goal, one more, my spouse will love me. Now, that's a beautiful desire. God wants that to be true, but that's a desire. That's not a goal because you can't determine the outcome. It takes two. What would the goal be? My goal will be I will love my spouse whether or not they love me in return. Are we together? One of the major contributors to the breakdown in marriage is the pursuit of bad goals. That Geraldine would always agree with me, respect me, understand me, admit when she is wrong, that she would love me. Those are great desires but bad goals. And we set ourselves up for disappointment because we don't differentiate between the two. In marriage, if you cannot control the outcome, then don't make it a goal. Enough said, right? Let's consider six goals for marriage. Six goals for marriage. How many of you like to be in control? Uh, I'm glad that you all like to have control. You're going to love these goals because you are entirely in control of each one. You're the only one that can keep these from happening. It's entirely up to you. No one can keep you from doing any one of them. You are free to toss them aside to your own peril or to make them the foundation of your marriage. And your spouse does not even need to be a willing participant. Now, don't take this in a negative way, but doesn't that feel good? There are six things we're going to talk about. And none of them can be interrupted by your spouse. Whether they choose to engage or not, it has no bearing on whether or not you can pursue these goals. Beautiful thing. 
It's entirely up to you. First goal, believing. Believing. Our first goal in marriage must always be believing. Believing what, you ask? You must believe in the all-embracing, unconditional love of God, not for the whole world, generally speaking, but for you particularly. Now, that's a Christian thing to say, right? We all know our B-I-B-L-E, God loves us. But that's the very point. We know it. But we must embrace the reality of it, not generically speaking, not vaguely speaking for the whole universe, but for ourselves particularly. Brendan Manning has a beautiful way. He's in heaven today, but he has a beautiful way of describing and explaining the love of God. Let me read a couple paragraphs from a message he gave that I was able to hear. We must, in the words of Brennan Manning, quote, Breathe deeply and let the focus of our inner life rest in this one truth, the staggering, the mind-blowing truth that God loves you just as you are and not as you should be. Because nobody in this room is as they should be. You must believe that God loves you, not that God loves you in some vague way, some general way, but the truth that God loves you in such a way that He'd rather die than be without you. This moment, do you believe that God loves you just as you are and not as you should be? Do you? He goes on. If you believe that God passionately loves you, then why the anxiety, fear, shame, guilt, low self-esteem, remorse, self-condemnation, and self-hatred? Most Christians would say that God loves them, but they would be hard-pressed to say that right now the essence of their Christian life is a love affair with God. He goes on, do you honestly believe that with all the wrong turns you've made in your past, the mistakes, the detours, the moments of sin, the selfishness, dishonesty, and degraded love that God has used them all to bring them to where you are right now? And do you believe that with Him you are right now standing on holy ground? This moment, do you honestly believe that God loves you beyond worthiness and unworthiness, beyond fidelity and infidelity, that He loves you in the morning sun and the evening rain, that He loves you without caution, regret, boundary, limit, or breaking point? No matter what's gone down, He can't stop loving you. Do you believe that? Do you? And He concludes, there is one God of the Christian vision. The God revealed in and by Jesus Christ, who this moment walks directly to you in your seat, looks you in the eye in the eye, and says, I have a word for you. I know your whole life story. I know every skeleton in your closet. I know every moment of sin, shame, dishonesty, and degraded love that has darkened your past. Right now, I know your shallow faith, your feeble prayer life. Nothing is hidden from my eyes. And my word to you is this. I dare you to trust that I love you as you are and not as you should be because you're never going to be this side of heaven all that you should be. End quote and amen. Listen closely, all right? The most radical demand of the Christian faith is to allow yourself to believe you are the object of the vast delight of the risen Jesus. It's the most important thing you could do. Why? Listen closely. Because it is only when you are captured by the humanly absurd, radical, unconditional love of God that you will choose to love your spouse the same way. Marriages need an absurd, unconditional, radical love to thrive. And the only way you will be able to offer it is if you first believe you are the recipient of it by God. Brennan Manning spent 42 years helping others experience the reality of God's love. It's at the heart of everything that he's written and everything that he did while on earth. A recovering alcoholic, a former Franciscan priest, a divorcee, his spiritual journey has taken him down a variety of paths. He's taught in seminaries, spoken to packed arenas, lived in a cave and labored with the poor in Spain and ministered to shrimpers in Alabama. This is what I found in the back end of one of his marvelous books. It was a self-introduction. I am Brennan. I'm an alcoholic. How I got there, why I left there, why I went back is the story of my life. But it's not the whole story. I am Brennan. I'm Catholic. How I got there, why I left there, why I went back is also the story of my life, but it's not the whole story. I am Brennan. I was a priest, but I'm no longer a priest. I was a married man, but I'm no longer a married man. How I got to those places, why I left those places, is the story of my life, too. 
but it's not the whole story. I am Brennan. I'm a sinner, saved by grace. That is the larger and more important story. Only God in His furious love knows the whole of it. It's beautiful, isn't it? I want you to know you are not the sum total of your struggles. You are not the sum total of your sins. You are not the sum total of your decisions. You are neither the sum total of your circumstances. You are a child of God. He loves you, period. Accept it. Embrace it. Take it. And hold on tightly to it. Maybe you've committed adultery. Maybe you've been betrayed. Maybe you've been left by the spouse. Maybe you were the spouse that left. Maybe you've been divorced. Maybe you were not wanted by your birth parents. Maybe you didn't have a father or a mother or either present as you were growing up. Maybe you were abused. Maybe, <clears throat> maybe all sorts of things happened to you. And maybe you've made all sorts of mistakes. And God says to you today, my child, neither, neither your painful experiences nor your sin have the capacity to cloud my vision of who you are. You are mine. And that's all that matters. Period. There's no more. That's all that matters. See, the absolute greatest impact that you can have on your spouse is believing yourself to be what God says is true about you. You know why? Because it calms you down. When you, when you know you are loved the way God actually describes His love for you in the Scriptures, when you know that and you embrace it and you live in that, you marinate in that, you then will act out of that and, and His love for you will calm you down. It reduces the internal pressure to prove your value to your spouse or anyone else. And it makes you less inclined, less desirous to... Promote yourself, to advance yourself, to protect or defend yourself. You will simply think of self less and more about your spouse. Why? Because you know you are well taken care of. Amen? The first goal of your marriage, I'm going to believe everything that God says about me that it's true. And out of that, you will be a lover of your spouse. More than any other factor, the reason marriages suffer because people fail to believe they're loved by God. They're destined then to relate out of a place of lack and by definition, insecurity. If you don't believe God loves you, you are by definition insecure. What's it like to be married to an insecure person? It's tough because they don't yet know how to love. So believe that you are and you'll be on the road to learning how to love very well. So believing is the first goal. The second goal is asking. Often we make comments about our spouse's weaknesses, their bad habits, right? Or something related to the family they came from when something happens to trigger some tension between us, right? Your spouse does something you don't like and you respond with some commentary about them. Your spouse responds then in kind and the conversation escalates. What I'm encouraging you to do is ask questions. I call them discovery questions. You don't have to wait till everything is perfect, but when you're out in the middle of some sort of heated discussion or argument, ask some discovery questions. And I've had you do this for homework a little bit in the last five weeks. Discovery questions are questions you ask your spouse that will better inform you what it's like to be married to you. The idea is to discover your flaws, not the way you see them, but the way they experience them. Your personality, your past, and how it lives on in the marriage, the way they experience it. Here's some questions you can ask. What do you see in me that I need What do you see in me that I need to see in me? Honey, what's it like to live on the other side of me? Does the way I behave toward you cause you to believe you're loved by me? What do I do that builds oneness in our marriage? What do I do that sabotages oneness in our marriage? Of the baggage I brought into our marriage or the baggage I've acquired since we got married, what irritates you the most? Questions of discovery. So when your spouse asks you that and you're answering the questions, be very clear, but be incredibly gracious. This is to help them understand it's not an opportunity to belittle them. And when you get your answer, don't contest, challenge, or debate him or her. 
Just listen and play back to them what you understand they're saying about the way they experience being married to you. First goal, believing. Second goal, asking. Third goal, establish the goal of blessing. Here's an idea. Bless when curse. Hmm, I can actually do that? Yes, that option's always on the table. You can bless when cursed. I, I didn't know that. Maybe I ought to try it. Yes, we all ought to try it. It comes from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Bless those who curse you. It may not be a four-letter word. It might just be a critique. It might be an unkind, sarcastic comment. It might be a put-down. Whatever it is, you can bless in return. That option's always on the table. And you have 100% control whether or not you utilize that option. That's why it's a goal. You can do it. And no one can keep you from doing it. We all do this, right? Our spouse says something critical or unkind, and we begin to assemble our comeback, right? They're sarcastic, and we respond in kind. They're critical. And we lob a verbal grenade at them as we turn and walk out the room. Isn't it remarkable how quickly peace can get sucked out of the room? <laughs> and the rest of the day then can become a grind. I tell you, we all know it if we're married. Marital tension drains you of energy. It's so taxing. Doesn't it wear you out? wears me out. Geraldine and I have been married for one, we got married in 1993. In 94, we took our vacation to Argentina because her whole family still lived there. So we're in Argentina. We're in an elevator. Geraldine, my mother-in-law, and yours truly. I don't know what I did. Probably something foolish or dumb or childlike. But Geraldine said something to me in this little tiny cramped elevator, right? She responded by using a Spanish word that has a wide range of implications. Right? For the most part, and I'm not going to give you the word, for the most part, it's used as a playful critique and even as a very casual greeting between close friends. And sometimes, though, it's used as a more serious and even crass criticism. When she used it toward me, how do you think I took it? A casual greeting between friends? No. As a criticism. I couldn't believe she said it. It's something that you call someone. I said, what did you call me? I couldn't believe it. I was fuming. And have you ever been mad at your spouse and they're right in front of you? One of those teeny little elevators, right? And then you got mother-in-law right here. <laughs> Which is part of the reason I interpreted it as something critical. Right? Someone else is there. I felt disrespected. So, I, I had had enough. I, I clammed up. We went down for I don't know how many weeks, but I went back early. I had to go back to work. Geraldine stayed a couple weeks longer. We're about three days away when this happened, about three days away from me catching my flight to go home. I just said, you know what? I'm digging in. I'm not going to say a word. It was quiet. Not just at the bottom of the elevator shaft. It was quiet all day, all night, the next day. I did everything I could to avoid that house, Geraldine and her family. I was waiting for what? What I deserved, an apology. Day one goes by, no apology. Dang, she's stubborn. Day two, no apology. She's real. Day three, I'm more angry about her lack of apologizing than I am about the words she used to describe me. Even though I'll tell you now, she wasn't intending to insult me. But I took it that way, right? Now time's running out. I gotta catch a flight. I'm waiting for her to apologize. She's waiting for me to lighten up not be so defensive. We get in the car, we drive to the airport, still no apology. I check in, no apology. Check my bags in, no apology. Waiting for the flight, this is really awkward, no apology. It's not just my wife, it's my wife's family, right? And I'm being as immature, I know you can't believe it, but I am. <laughs> now I'm thinking, shoot, I, got, I, I gotta go. I gotta go and say goodbye. What's this gonna be like? So I walk over and I give her one of those really warm sort of dead fish goodbye. Right? <laughs> and as I'm hugging her, she says, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry you took offense to what I said. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm so steeped in my eyes. It's too little too late. I didn't say that's what I'm thinking. And I'm also thinking, yeah, that's the type of an apology. If you were really sorry, you would have said something when we got out of the elevator. Or at least before the sun went down, right? Three days. I mean, that's the kind of apology you give when you're really not sincere. And, she, and it's sort of obligatory as well, right? Because I'm hopping on a plane 7,000 miles away. You know, now, at least if my plane goes down over the Andes, she can say, well, at least I apologized before he died. <laughs> that's how I took it. 
from Buenos Aires over the Andes to Chile, Santiago is an hour and a half. There's a layover there. All the way over the Andes, I'm thinking of one thing. Layover, I'm thinking of one thing. I'll hop on the plane again. We go to Lima, Peru. It's several hours. I'm thinking of one thing. There's a layover there. I'm thinking of one thing. Get in the plane. There's another eight hours to LAX. I get in the super shuttle. I'm still thinking of one thing. How stubborn my wife is. <laughs> I was fixated and I was exhausted. I was obsessing over it because by my anger and lack of forgiveness, I had granted power, power to that one offense. And Satan, of course, did all he could to keep me in that fixated, obsessive place. How brilliant am I? A massive waste of time and energy. Well, there is a better way. And to show you that I really haven't grown over the years, <laughs> within the last year, Geraldine, well, she said I could say this. My wife has the gift of sarcasm. She's really good at it. In her words, and I quote, I quote, she says, I'm fluent in three languages, Spanish, English, and sarcasm. Those are her words. Well, sometimes I like it, sometimes I don't. I love my wife's sense of humor, but sometimes I just don't like the sarcasm. On this particular day, several months ago, she was being really sarcastic and a little bit, I thought, critical. There was a bite to it, and I simply wasn't in the mood. So I responded in kind. I launched some very sarcastic and unkind comments her way, and she was noticeably taken aback and ticked. So I calmed the whole situation down. I said this. And now you know what it's like living in my shoes. Okay. <laughs> We've processed these arguments many, many times. Right. <laughs> okay, now what she says to me then, <laughs> ladies, I'm sorry, but your logic sometimes, I know it's a, that's a, a sexist statement, it's generalization, but Anyways, <laughs> this is what she says to me. It's okay for me to be sarcastic, Brian, because I'm always that way. I'm always that way. You should be used to it. <laughs> she wasn't done. You're not that way with me, so when you are, it's more hurtful and wrong. <laughs> so, I'm thinking, so I'm the good person in this arrangement. And I'm still wrong. There's a better way. There's a better way. The option of blessing is always on the table. When your spouse treats you poorly or you receive it as poorly, whether it's with malice or just being careless, bless them. Perhaps right now you're not in the best place with your spouse. Maybe you even came here this morning and there's a bit of tension or a lot of tension between you. In your mind, it just you're running through it over and over again. All of the reasons why you are right and your spouse is wrong. Why you're the victim and they're the scoundrel. You've created a legal brief. You've assembled a biased jury of your peers, presented your case before the judge, and your spouse has been declared guilty of all the charges in your head. You're right and he or she is wrong. You know how much energy that takes, right? That's draining. What if? What if in the moment your spouse says an unkind, thoughtless, or critical thing to you, you bless them instead? You replace what I would normally say with a word of blessing or grace. And by that, I don't mean you say to your wife or your husband, now nah, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May he make his countenance to shine above, above, above whatever is over you and grant you his peace. Amen. I don't mean a clerical blessing, right? It might just be a blessing in your mind, right? You can't get the words about saying, you know, I'm, I'm going to choose. God, thank you for my husband. Thank you for my wife. Maybe you do say something. Maybe right in the moment. Maybe you wait a few minutes. In the face of sarcasm or criticism, I care about you, honey. Or you could say, you matter to me, even when I don't show it or I don't show it in the right ways. Or you can say, I care about the frustration you must be feeling right now. Make it your goal to bless in the face of unfair criticism and cutting remarks. I don't think we take seriously enough the biblical principle of sowing and reaping. It's a biblical principle. And Paul plays off of Jesus' words in Galatians chapter 6. 
What do you want to see surface in your marriage? You must plant those seeds if you want that crop. Well, what about my spouse? What if they don't want to plant positive seeds in our marriage? Well, that should have no bearing on your agricultural commitments. You are a farmer, promised by God that whatever you plant, you will reap. So plant blessing, plant grace, mercy, plant compassion. In due season, you'll reap a harvest of those very things. Will it cost you? Dearly. And the crop may be very slow growing, but the promise remains. I told you about my friend, the older lady in the church where I grew up, Nell Vieira. Forty years, she lived with a rotten husband. I gave you details before, just to understand it's accurate. A rotten guy. She blessed and blessed and blessed, planted seeds of patience, forgiveness, grace, mercy, love. Four decades. What a waste. But then there was a crop. One day, unexpectedly, he drops to his knees, sobbing. He says, how how can you love me the way you've loved me? The evil man I've been, the things I've done to you, the way I've ignored you, belittled you, put you down, made you feel less than for decades. How can you love me? I want your Jesus. And he gave his life to Christ. They had three. Out of 43 years, they had three years of a beautiful marriage, and then he died. But he now is in heaven because his wife sowed grace, mercy, and forgiveness and treated him as Jesus always loved him. Question for you, would you like to be free? Do you want to be free? Then bless those who curse you. Bless them in the face of offensive words. Well, that's not fair. I didn't ask you if it was fair. I asked if you wanted to be blessed, if you wanted to be free. Life isn't fair, married or not. Nowhere in the Bible are we told that life is fair. We're told just the opposite. And we're told that because life is not fair, it needs to be, what? Covered in God's grace. If we live by the standards of fairness, we would not be alive at all. For fairness demands that we pay for our sins at the cost of our own lives. So this life is not fair, and praise God, you don't want it to be fair. If this was fair, that could not have happened. So live that way, not by the fairness that you think ought to prevail this side of heaven, because it won't. So bless in the face of cursing. Believing, asking, blessing. The fourth thing is processing. We're talking about taking the time to be alone with God to intentionally deal with the hurt, the wound, or the offense, or the injury that you sustain in marriage. Remember Joseph? We don't have time to go there, but go read the the story of Joseph, chapter 36 to chapter 50 of Genesis. He spent 20 years as a slave because his brother sold him into slavery to the Egyptians. He lost his home, his father, his country, everything, his language, his freedom, because his brother sinned against him. For 20 years, he was either able to stew or to process in a healthy way. You come to the time, 20 years after being a slave, he reunites with his brothers. They don't know it's him, he knows it's them. He sees them, he starts to cry. You don't think it hurt? It cut him to the core. So much so that he had to leave the room when he saw them. He was crying so badly. He comes back and he said, everything he then tells them who he is. Everything you did to me, you meant for evil to harm me, but what you did, God, is turned it around on its head and turned it out for something that's good. If you know the story, you can read it. He processed. And so what I'm encouraging you to do, whatever the offense is by your spouse, as soon as you can, you'll bless them and run (laughs) if you need to, right? And, And go find some time to process. Process with God. And I write it down. I have these process sheets. It's not like I have like a hundred of them. I carry them all the time because Geraldine's always offending me, right? And that's not what I mean. But when I am hurt, whether it's my fault or not or her fault or not or it's all just jumbled and chaotic, I sit down and I, I process circumstances, events in our married life. And this is how I do it. First, in writing, I recall the sin. I recall the sin. You can write this down. That I believe my spouse committed against me. What is it that actually happened? And I'm very specific. This isn't to make them look bad. It's so that I can articulate to God in writing, this is what happened, but I'm also articulating for me. Secondly, I share with God the feelings that I experienced as a result. I felt insulted, minimized, invisible, cheated, robbed, betrayed, disrespected, whatever it is. God, this is how I felt when she did that or she did that or she said that. Then I assess the damage. This is what it cost me. It hurt. Cost me X, Y, or Z, right? 
Then tell God what you wish your spouse had done instead. Then express to God the words that best describe your attitude toward your spouse since they injured you. I'm angry, I'm bitter, revengeful, distrusting, I'm repulsed, whatever it is. God, this is, this is my response to what they did. And that's just to all, it's just it's to get it out, it's to process the emotion. Better process with God than just to start lobbing grenades at your husband or wife. But then you've got to get to the place where you take all of that pain and you walk to the cross. And when I say walk to the cross, you don't walk to an empty cross. Walk to the cross while Jesus is being crucified. Walk to the cross while Jesus is being crucified. Close your eyes, drop your knees before the cross and say, Jesus, here's what happened to me. I know by what you're doing right now on this cross, I know you know it's 2,000 years ago, but what you did on the cross, somehow you can get involved in this and you can move me forward so that I can treat my wife the same way you're treating me right now. You're on the cross for me. Are we together? So process. And it really leads to forgiving. This is the fifth thing. Sometimes we build oneness, sometimes we sabotage it. Like I said, sometimes we're the victim, sometimes we're the scoundrel. And marriages need massive doses of forgiveness. You must become, make it your goal to be the most incurable, habitual forgiver in your marriage. If you're going to have a competition, compete here. You should be the best forgiver anywhere. Real quickly, we've looked at this subject in greater detail. Let me just say, forgiveness is volitional. It is a choice. You don't have to have all the commensurate good feeling to forgive. It's primarily, it's a judicial decision, so it's a choice. It's not, I want to forgive, but I choose now to forgive, God. It's offered in a moment's time, and then healing, of course, does take time. That's why you have a process sheet, if you will. Forgiveness is also emotional. That's not to say that you wait until you feel like it to forgive. If you wait until you feel like it to forgive, you'll probably never get there. But I am acknowledging that while it is a choice, even if I'm still really reeling inside, it's a choice because you know it's the right thing to do. But it hits your emotions, though it's not driven by emotion. Forgiveness is also living with the consequences. If your spouse said something to you in public, maybe a cutting remark, a sarcastic remark, and three or four friends were around, right, or more, you may forgive her, but there's no guarantee that your reputation in the minds of those listening is restored. She may have done damage to your reputation in the minds of those friends. You may not be able to recover that. So what is forgiveness? It's also a willingness to live with the consequences. Your husband or your wife may spend a whole lot of money behind your back and get you in financial trouble. You can forgive them, but you also will undoubtedly have to live with the consequences and ride out the storm of their unwise secret behind your back choices. So forgiveness is hard because you're saying, I'll ride out those consequences with them. So it's volitional, it's a choice. It hits your emotions, and it's also living with the consequences. Forgiveness is saying there's more grace in my heart than there is sin in your life. There's more grace in my heart for you than there is sin in my life. But forgiveness is not blind. It's not turning a blind eye. It's not denying it. It's acknowledging it. That's why you have a process sheet, if you will. Forgiveness is not forgetting. God remembers everything I've ever done wrong, not to hold it against me. But it would be crazy to say that God forgets the stuff I've done. That would mean he would say, why in the world did I die on the cross for Brian? No, he remembers. The beauty of his forgiveness is, just like the beauty of your forgiveness of your spouse is, you do remember. And after having forgiven them, every time it comes back to your recollection, you cover it in grace. You cover it in grace. That's what God does. So forgiveness is not blind. It's not denial. You're not just brushing off the injury, pretending it didn't happen. It's not forgetting, and it's not reconciliation. You can forgive and not yet have reconciliation achieved because forgiveness is the goal. Reconciliation is what? The desire. Forgiveness takes one person. Reconciliation takes two. So forgiveness is not necessarily in that moment in time reconciliation. It doesn't mean that the relationship is back to the way it was. It may take time for trust to be uh, regained. But that doesn't mean you have to wait to forgive until trust is regained. Those are two separately connected, but they happen separately. So, there's no greater reason than this to forgive. You should forgive your spouse because you are loved. That's why you should forgive. 
fully engaging with the reality that you're loved by God, that he emptied himself for you, that he would rather die than to have you spend one minute in hell, that, my friends, is the bedrock foundation of your life. It's where we started this morning. From that place of full and eternal acceptance by God, there is your ultimate reason for living by grace, and grace means forgiveness. Show me someone who forgives, and I will show you a delightfully free person, secure in the love of God. Question. Would God forgive in you the sin that you choose not to forgive in your spouse? Of course you would. Understand that your pain doesn't define you, but it will control you if you refuse to forgive. Then lastly, thanking. It's a beautiful goal. What I'm referring to here is the choice of thanking God. Thank God for His goodness, His righteousness, His perfect character, that He's trustworthy. See, in the face of things not going so well in marriage, to be able to say to God, I thank you, God, that you, regardless of what's going on here, you are good and perfect in all of your ways. You cannot not be good, so I'm trusting in that. I wish this was different, but I know that you are my one constant. Not only do you love me, you are righteous in all of your ways. You have the power to stop this if you will, but you've also given us what? Free will. So you're allowing things to happen because you won't defy our freedom of choice. And while we've made choices that have resulted in the, the difficulty that we're in right now, that doesn't mean you're promoting it. You are good and righteous in all of your ways. That's the wider context. God takes no delight in sin, and though He desires that your wounds had never happened, He has plans for the pain of your marriage. Did you hear that? Though He takes no delight in sin, He has plans for the pain that you've experienced in marriage. He's using it to bring you into a deeper encounter with Him. Do you know that intimacy with God is the cost of pain? Or better said, it's the prize of pain. Intimacy with God between you and Him that is the prize of the pain that you've gone through because he will use the pain not just to drive you to your knees and grind you into the dust. That's not what I mean. He will take the pain in your life and his intention is not to allow the pain to be between you and him, but the pain, if you will, to be behind you, to thrust you, to push you into his arms. Intimacy with God, it's the prize of all the pain you've gone through. He has a plan for your pain. However you may have contributed to the struggles in your marriage, you cannot ultimately derail His purposes. He intends to use you as a vessel for His honor and through you to make famous the matchless name of Jesus Christ on earth. So, thank God that He's good in all of His ways, no matter what He allows you to experience in marriage. And the proof of faith is always thanking, rejoicing, and celebrating. So there you have it, six goals, believing, asking, Blessing, processing, forgiving, and thanking. We've said it all along. By design, God intends marriage to what? Come on now. <laughs> to kill you. It's not homicide, right? It's the willingness to lay yourself down for your husband or your wife. It is to follow the way of the cross. Speaking of which, look at the screen, Philippians 2, 7, and 8. Speaking of Jesus, what did he do? What did he do? He emptied himself. What's your role in marriage? Empty yourself for the benefit of the other. Taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. He emptied himself. It's the pathway to a wonderful marriage. And no one can keep you from doing it. Amen? Let's stand together. Hillary and Kate are going to come back out, but I'd like us to pray a prayer. I'd also like to say to anyone here, all of you here who are single, you've been so patient these five weeks. I hope that you've gained some encouragement, even though currently you're not married, as we've talked about this important subject. We're going to say a prayer right now, and again, I just thank you for being patient. This is a marriage prayer. If you're married, let's pray it together. Thank you, Lord. Let's pray together, right? Thank you, Lord, for each specific strong point and admirable quality in my spouse. Thank you for bringing us together and for the way your love sweetens our earthly love. I bless you, Lord, 
for the many benefits you've given me through my beloved spouse. Yet, Lord, you far surpass even the best person in my life. You are distinguished above all. You are my life, my reward, and my inheritance. Who can I compare with you? You're my perfect life partner, my dearest, most delighted loved one, my always present companion. Indeed, you are the strength of my life and my portion forever. Thank you that you are so vastly wonderful, so utterly and completely delightful that you can meet and overflow the deepest demands of my soul. Thank you for the specific weaknesses or failures of my spouse, such as indifference, lack of understanding, harshness, explosiveness, a critical spirit, undue need to control, excessive independence, failure to love, lack of attentiveness. I'm grateful that you're with me to meet my needs even when my spouse fails to do so. I especially want to thank you that you are within me, working to make me more like Jesus, more patient, more loving, forgiving, more gentle through the very things I dislike in my spouse. Thank you, too, that I face no heartache alone. Thank you that you're constantly at work and that you're able to do exceeding abundantly beyond whatever I ask or even think according to your good pleasure. Because Jesus emptied himself for me, I commit to empty myself for their benefit and therefore commit to you my life, my spouse, and our journey ahead. To God be the glory. Amen. Amen? Amen. Amen.